morning folks you're catching me in my pjs today and my cup of tea it is the first monday of the year and i thought i would start a vlog because i had honestly so many lovely messages from you guys over the christmas period saying how much my vlogs were making you feel better and um bringing you joy in this horrendous time that we're living in so i thought i would start some low-key january vlogging um obviously with some reading and i thought i would just yeah keep you guys company over these um next few weeks i'm back at university which is all online and then i'm working in person um like with the children i work with um so yeah it's all a bit of a mess but we are keeping on keeping on and i've got a few like low-key productive vibes coming in but i'm not one of those like super aggressive new year's people but I like to use this time to like reset and make some more um, plans. But yeah, I thought I would just start on a Monday with you guys. I have two plasters over my thumbs, which makes me look like a child because both my thumb, this is so gross, so sorry if you're gross out, but both my thumb fingernails have broken, but like so far down my nail that if I would rip them off, I'd be like, have no nail left so I've just plastered them up and thought I'll just think about them another day <laughs> um but yeah I am about to get ready for the day Tom is doing like an, a course um this week so he's like online in the other room and he has to get up early because the course is on Dutch time but um yeah I'm gonna start my to-do list I'll show you guys all of that but first we need to make the bed and then I will come back and tell you what I've been reading Right lads, I'm slightly more presentable, I would say. Maybe not, I'm wearing my trackies because it's very cold in England at the minute. Um, and honestly, my day's not off to a great start. <laughs> I can't find my like weekly planner sheet that I swear by, which is so annoying, but I'm trying not to do that thing where I normally get in my head about stuff like that and then I can't find it. So then I'm like, oh my God, then I can't do my work for the day or I can't do this, where it's like, I could just use a blank piece of paper today and try and find it later. I also just did like a 20 minute blitz maybe not even 20 like 10 minute blitz of our flat um something tom and i really like to do uh if we feel like a bit in a funk or um just like we can't concentrate because like i'm one of those people who finds it really hard to concentrate when my like surroundings are messy that we just like put a timer on and then like blitz and put everything back in its place um i find that really helpful tom's like i said on a course so i just did it quickly like tidy the kitchen from breakfast, put the cushions all back. Um, we got into a bad habit of like leaving our lounge and our living room in a mess, but like when we go to bed at night. So we wake up in the morning and it looks really gross. Um, it's probably better to do it at night, but um, we've been doing it in the morning. So yeah, I just did that. Feel a lot better. Can't put my laptop stand either, so that's good. Um, but I'm going to tell you guys about the books I'm reading and then I will sit down and start my work for the day. Mm and probably make another pot of tea because that is one of my joys right now and these beautiful like ham potted mugs that tom got me for christmas aren't they so cute i don't even know if you can see this like pale pink here and i love it when they have the drip and he got me two of these and they're really funny because they're sort of like oval shaped but really like them in my hands i'm a big ceramic person so i love these and they're actually made like near and um, where tom's family are from so we thought that was really cool Anyway, enough about pottery, <laughs> more about books. So I am reading Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. This was sent to me by Serpent's Tale. It's a debut book and it's about trans motherhood. I think this video will probably go up before my 2021 goals, but I'll give you a sneak peek either way. All you would have heard me talk about it is I want to read more stories about trans experiences. I want to read from more trans authors and I want to just ensure that I'm educating myself enough to be the best ally. Um, one of my favourite people online um shona Fay, i'll link their um page their instagram page below they do some amazing content and they recently interviewed with um owen jones and it was really cool talking about the rise of 
anti-trans narratives and that interaction with the far right in the UK. Um, I thought it was really interesting. But they're writing their books coming out in September, I believe. It's called like Tears for Trans. I'm really, really excited to read that. But yeah, alongside um, those more formal educational books, I wanted to re ensure I'm reading just narrative stories that include trans people that are not necessarily trying to educate me. And this book by Tori Peters is so, so interesting. I'm about 50 pages in. So we center around three characters. Reese, who is um, a trans woman who um, is dating and So Reese is our main protagonist and she is a trans woman living in New York. I'm going to say this is all set in New York. Um, and then we have Amy, who Reese used to date and they were a couple living together when Amy was a trans woman. They then transitioned into back, like into their cis personhood as a man and now live as a man because of an incident that happened to them <clears throat> while they were identifying as a trans woman and then um so amy then refers to herself as amers and is starts a dating or an affair with um his boss katrina katrina gets pregnant even though amos thinks that because of the estrogen that he took he can no longer he thought he would no longer like have active ability to like impregnate a person but he does and then it sort of all goes from there so we're just up to the point where katrina finds out she's pregnant and amos gets in amos gets in contact with reese and proposes this idea that they raise the child as the three of them because um Reese really wanted and always has wanted to be a mother because, because of her experiences as a trans woman. She doesn't believe it's possible for her to have a child and she doesn't know how to navigate that arena. And it's just so, so interesting. I really appreciate that Peters is sort of just throwing you straight into the story. Like you don't, there's not a lot of, I guess in literary um, circles, you talk about like gazing and this idea of othering in narratives that books that are written, even if they are written from an own voice's perspective, they are like sort of pandering to a mainstream market in the way that they over explain. You often hear people talk about the male gaze or the white gaze. And I think you could also argue that a lot of um, texts have a cis gaze, whereas I feel like this is really purposefully telling you how it is and it's up to the reader to ensure that they understand the context of the experiences, which I really appreciate. And I think I'm potentially predicting some reviews where people would suggest that like, oh, they found it confusing. There was a lot of terminology that they weren't familiar with. But I think that is a reflection of your blind spots as a reader, as opposed to um, an author that needs to explain everything to you because I find that as a reader I find that frustrating and then I also can understand people from the own voices communities that are being written about that they think they also find that frustrating because the book isn't really then for them it is for the gaze of people less informed than them I hope that makes sense that was kind of complicated but I'm really enjoying it so far and I will let you know how I get on with it later in the week so for now let's go study <laughs> just popping on to say I don't think I've said in a video um thank you so much 500 subscribers that I just it like kind of blows my mind that people are actually interested in what I have to say and I've actually 
received so many gorgeous messages from you guys especially over christmas saying how much the vlogs helped you and i just honestly think that's so sweet and um should like have the best watchers ever so thank you so much for subscribing tell your friends like the button share the videos all that kind of stuff but honestly i'm just shocked and happy that 500 of you want to watch me um so yeah i thought i would put that in now before i forget good morning happy campus oh my goodness i'm so tired i'm back with tea i actually look so rough honestly I had such a shit day yesterday and do everything they wanted to do got really behind on my university work and then got stressed waiting for our prime minister to make an announcement but today folks it's gonna be a better day. I'm listening to the wildest audiobook ever. I need to like get ready for the day and then sit down and tell you about it because it is like keeping me up at night. It's so dramatic. Um, I'm still on the cult bandwagon. So yeah, we've moved on to polygamy. And let me tell you, it's fucking depressing. So I'm gonna sit down and tell you about that once I get ready for the day. My ratchet thumb, that's enough, thank you. Right, lads, I've got change for the day. Got my cup of tea. Made my to do list, which you guys always hear me rabbit on about, but in times like these, you can't be a pen and paper list that includes refill my prescription and wash my hair because there's nothing more satisfying than taking those things off so shout out to the paper to-do list um gonna buy all my friends one for their birthdays this year because i feel like they are life-changing anyway i'm listening to the sound of gravel a memoir by ruth warner um i'm almost near the end of it i probably have like an hour left and it is you can see my eyes puffy it is pure devastation it's so 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 tragic it's the story ostensibly of a small polygamous cult in like rural north mexico like on the border to america that focuses on one family the labaran family um and the father basically started this like um mormon fundamentalist polygamy cult i guess or religious colony they call themselves a colony and we focus on the life of Ruthie, who is the like 39th of the 41 children that this man has. And we follow her family and her, like, I think that's at some point she has like 13 siblings, um, like from her mother. And then she has like all these other step siblings. And ostensibly it is about the cult life and the polygamy, but really it's just a story of like destitution, of poverty and of that, that lack of self actualization that comes from these situations where there is no way out. And I don't know, it spoke a lot, it's speaking a lot about rural life and some horrendously tragic things happen to these children. I mean, it's got every trigger warning in the book if you're talking about grooming, paedophilia, infant death, all these things. And it's terrifying to read from the point of view of someone who obviously cares deeply about children and as an educator, um, I mean, there's very rare mention of these children going to school or learning things. The focus is pretty much that you will, especially for Ruthie as a girl, like you will leave school as young as you can. You will then help raise your siblings and you will then get married and join with other sister wives and have your own children and raise this big family. But it's... Um, it's also a lot about disability. There's a lot of children in Ruthie's family who um, are disabled, a lot who suffer with mental health as well as physical health conditions, which aren't fully explained because I think Ruthie's telling the story of her from a child so she doesn't obviously fully understand. Um, but one of her siblings is institutionalised and it's just a really harrowing account of that interaction with poverty and disability and the the real lack of support that can be created in these children that just fall under the net because they're not in mainstream school or they're not being supported by social workers. They have a social worker for a couple of years when a neighbor reports that they're being left alone in their trailer for like days on end while the mother is off with her like part-time husband. Um, but it's just pure tragedy. And I think it's a really interesting exploration of 
that that obsession with in a belief of something that can cloud your judgment as a parent as a mother and this blind faith in a greater power because even when someone dies they say oh it was her time to go even like for a five-year-old child well that's what god wanted and i just struggle with that so much and i think it's um yeah, it's just a really, I mean, harrowing but interesting look at the interaction between all these different social issues, um, in particular disability and, yeah, like I say, destitution. Um, I know, obviously, we know because the memoirs were written and published that she makes it out and then lives life. And luckily, her grandmother is um, not part of the cult and is there to support them back in America. But, yeah, it's just... <sighs> It's a lot, it's a lot. It's probably not the book to be reading right now, but I'm really enjoying it. It's very interesting. And like I said about the Scientology one that I was like DNF'd last, in my last vlog, um, this one ha does have a lot of the minutia and the mundane elements of the day-to-day -day life, but you can see them building to these like milestone points in their life and especially a tragic accident that just happened, which reminded me of Educated when there's a huge action in there. This also, this idea of safety and childhood and like wild childhood and you know, ver versus children taking risks and how, like, in middle-class situations, children are often protected and, um, like, cotton walls versus this, like, protection of their safety. And, yeah, I don't know. It just gave me a lot to think about. And I was really unexpected. I listened to it on the script. But I will fill you in on my final thoughts when I finish it. For now, I'm going to go sit at that desk and do a little FaceTime study with my friends. So I'll speak to you guys later. Vote below if Tom should shave his head for lockdown. Part of me thinks that you'll look really hot and the other part makes me think I'll hate it and it'll be like an egg. What do you think? Maybe we can Photoshop it. Maybe I ask CJ, she's good at can. I think it would be like, do I look like Renton from Train Spotting? Oh, that's not hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or... Yeah, that would be my, my fear. Yeah, okay. Also, it is cold. Your head would be cold. I know, but I just wear hats. Oh, that's true. You could you look good in hats. You could just wear hats all year. Yeah. Maybe we should do it. Yeah, maybe. Maybe, it, yeah, it's just something to do, isn't it? Yeah, it could be fun. <laughs> Let us know below, guys. Should Tom shave his head? Yes, or... Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's now very dark, guys, and I haven't caught up with you. I finished The Sound of Gravel earlier. Also, I'm so sorry that light is reflecting my glasses. Should I take my glasses off? Is that less annoying? Um, I finished The Sound of Gravel, and it was really harrowing. We actually skipped to the epilogue where we just find out that all of the children, like, in their late 30s, and we're, like, happy because they're married and not living polygamy and are um pretty much out of the cult, but we don't really understand how they got there, which I think is fine. Like, I understand that they need privacy, um overall I really enjoyed it. it was extremely harrowing as I mentioned in my other clip but what's interesting is um sorry for such a bad toothache a lot of people have spoken about the book The Polygamist Daughter it has this cover which I feel like is really memorable if you ever read cult books and I've never read it but I just found out from researching it it's actually the same cult but a different family on the colony and it's a daughter of that and then you can look up in the both authors who've written the book have like met up with each other and stuff. So I think I'm going to read that one, but like I'll probably give it a month or two. So I am I'm not overrun with the polygamy cult info. But then I started Meaty by Samantha Irby. Um, if you guys watched my top 10 non-fiction, Samantha Irby's Wow No Thank You was in there. And I love her writing. Honestly, I was having such a rough day again. Um, And I just thought her writing brings me so much joy. She's a humorist. Um, a black queer woman writing in America and I find her so funny. I loved one, I thank you. So I'm going back to her debut essays, which were Meaty and then there's We're Never Meeting in Real Life is the second one. They're all on Scribd. So if you guys are Scribd subscribers, you can check them out there. And I just um, love her voice. Like I feel like she's so perfect to narrate her own books. So yeah, really, um, sorry, that's my laptop light going off. Really love um loving that and that's some nice solace for now um i also just read a really interesting article which i will link down below on vulture about american dirt and the controversy that was around that book i've mentioned it a couple of times in videos and i also did a post on instagram about like 10 books i read instead um and i was having an interesting chat with my friends and 
about it because it was obviously there was a lot of controversy in the book community but it still went on to be a bestseller and I think it's really interesting conversations about echo chambers and how we um, potentially perpetuate those in our communities um but what was so interesting is the conversation about own voices um which you guys hear me talk about a lot but in here particularly um the editor of Flatiron who are the people that published the book was a staunch believer in freedom of speech you guys know if you read Nezra and Malik's book and that I spoke about earlier last year that obviously the myth of a free speech crisis is not something we're experiencing here in the west but um, he was a staunch believer in that everyone should be able to write their own stories and therefore an author's identity doesn't make a difference to um, the story that they're telling, which potentially I can understand in some aspects. But what was so interesting in this article, if he truly believed that and if that was the message of his company or the publishing house, why did they go so far to try and illuminate these false um, connections between the author and her uh, Latinx um, roots which didn't really exist they basically played up the fact that she had a Puerto Rican mother um grandmother but still connected and considered herself white and then she also spoke as her husband as if her husband was an immigrant and an undocumented person when it turned out that he was actually white Irish and I don't know I just thought it was really interesting this idea that of like talking the talk and walking the walk because yeah you might believe in freedom of speech and think everyone can say um what they want but then in the same breath you're also trying really hard to make it seem like your book is own voices that doesn't really add up to me but anyway i will link the article down below i thought it was really interesting i wanted to get tom he's just um at the end of finishing burnt sugar so hopefully tomorrow i can get him on to talk about that um and yeah i'm gonna get into bed really early tonight and read detransition baby so i'll speak to you guys in the morning hi guys long time no speak Actually, I don't even know if you'll be able to tell because this vlog just like carries on, doesn't it? But we took a good few days off because Tom and I got really sick. Not with Corona, but with um, the flu. He's still pretty ill, to be honest. So I really want him to come on and review Burn Sugar, but I don't know if he will. Anyway, bookish updates for you. I just got this in the post, which is Conversations with Edward Saad, written by Tarek Ali. I've read parts of Orientalism like for study and stuff but I haven't actually read it cover to cover and I would like to but I'm very interested in um Edward Saad's writing and what he has to say about imperialism and colonialism so I actually got this for Christmas from Tom's parents but it came late because it was like a second-hand copy so he's like a cultural historian political activist like very anti-imperial anti-colonial all those good things. So this is his interviews with him in 1994, the year before he lost, the decade before he lost his battle to cancer. His personal engagement with the trouble, troubling and volatile issues, including his initiation to politics, how he got involved with Palestine. And I said in my, well, I haven't actually put it up yet, but one of my intentions this year is to read more about the Palestine-Israeli conflict. So Edward Saad is a good person to start with. I took a pause on Detransition Baby, but I will finish it by the end of this vlog and tell you about it. But I am really liking it. It's just potentially a bit too wordy. Like it's like pages and pages of single conversations with people. And I'm not sure if it's like completely perfectly edited, but I understand it's a debut. And I also read a phenomenal review um, by a wonderful trans person talking about what the book was for and like how this book is written for trans women and you're just lucky as this person to read it which was really insightful I will link it down below um I also then have started reading on my iPad random I never read on there so sad today by Melissa Broder here's a picture of the cover this was sparked because my wonderful friend CJ and Jay sent me an essay that she had written on lit hub about having a husband with a chronic illness who he actually has the same illness as me I will also link that review, I mean that article down below. I didn't, I found it really confronting to read and I'm not sure, again maybe it's about audience, I don't think it was written for me as someone who lives with the illness she was speaking about. I felt as though I would have much rather heard from her husband's perspective to be honest on his lived experience because I understand she was like very honest about her selfishness about marrying someone with that disease but like as someone who lives with that illness it felt like very like 
I don't know, just like quite horrible in places. Like I cried a lot when I read it, but I would like, it's interesting to read. It goes also on a random tangent about non-monogamy and the two things don't really marry up that well, but um, it talks a lot about like having illness and stuff. So that's interesting if you are new to learning about chronic disease. But anyway, off the back of that, I started to read her essay collection, So Sad Today, and I'm really enjoying it. She's really funny. She's like that typical, like, messy woman brand, but has some really interesting insights about addiction, growing up Jewish, and um, having, like, an addictive personality. Um, there's a lot of trigger warnings for disordered eating, and I've got her novel to read, Milk Fed. Um, I got a proof copy of that, but I'm really glad I've read this first to get an insight into her writing style before I pick up the novel. So yeah, I switched to that and I think the essays are really nice to read when you're feeling sick because you can just sort of read one and then put it down. Then I also started listening or have finished an Agatha Christie, The Unexpected Guest on Scribd. I love Aggie Christie. I grew up with her. My mum is a huge Agatha Christie reader. Um, so I find a lot of comfort in her, especially on audio. It's like listening to like a radio play. So that was really short, like three hours, just like a murder story of someone in a big house. Um, I listened to it basically like in one day when I was on and off sleeping. So that's what I've been reading at the moment. When I finish the transition baby, I will hook you back up with that. As for my plans, it's Saturday. We're not leaving the house just because Tom's gonna await a corona result, even though like we're pretty definite he doesn't have it, but better safe than sorry. Um, and yeah, so it'll just be more reading, more movie watching, the same old, same old. But yeah, sorry for the pause in this. I'm not even sure if you'll be able to notice it, but I thought I would just check in and tell you guys those updates. So I'll speak to you when I finish something else. And we've got wagon mamas because we're ill and we feel sorry for ourselves. We've also got the duvet on the sofa kind of situation. We're coming at you from the sofa, lads and ladettes, because we're still sick. Tom's quite sick. I'm a little bit better. Hello. We're literally wearing the same jumper in all these clips. <laughs> we just don't shower, I don't think. That's fine. We're disgusting. We are. Um, I wanted Tom to uh, come and talk about because he's reading. Right now you're reading Memorial, right? Yeah, I've got about 50 pages of that time left. Really? Yeah. You powered through that. That's a long book. I know, but I've been sick. <laughs> How are you liking it? Yeah, I really like yeah, yeah, I really like it. If I had one criticism, it would be that I think it... It could have been about 50 pages shorter. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. Um, we listened to... I don't know if I've mentioned it in this vlog, but we... I don't think I would have listened to uh, the A24 podcast with Ocean Vong and Brian Washington. And they're talking about... They both signed contracts that have both of those books, Ocean Vong's and um, Memorial, turned into TV and film with A24, the production company. And it's like such an interesting interview set up because they're obviously both writers and it's so beautiful, so eloquent. Yeah, like, because obviously they kind of, they, in the interview, they discuss themselves that they both consider themselves to be part of this new, way new school of yeah. writers. Yeah, of like queer writers. And I don't know, it was just amazing. Like we were listening, thinking like, if only we could be that eloquent. Well, yeah, and now, because I listened to that before I started reading Memorial, and then mm. I read it, like, it's going to be a really cool yeah, it's TV like, adaptation, I think. Oh, yeah, same. I think it's made for TV. Um, especially the kind of TV really like, like, slow blur, burn, yeah. like, beautifully shot TV. Um, I, I'm glad you're loving that. I'll link the podcast down below. And what are your thoughts about um, Burnt Sugar? You finished yeah, well, it was my first book of 2021. Nice. And it was a very good way to start the year. You're off to a strong start with both of those I know, as well. But the only way from here is down. No, that. no, <laughs> you can have a five star month. Did you think that Doshi did a good job at interrogating, like, mother daughter? Yeah. Um, or complicated family, I yeah, guess. Yeah, I just thought as it was someone really with a... beautifully written. And yeah. the, the thing that impressed me most about it was that. She she avoided going for those really easy payoffs, and at every time where she could have just fallen back into this quite convenient trope, trope where yeah. everything comes together, she just constantly turning away from that, and it it was so kind of grounded in the reality of how relationships with families are negotiated and unfold over time, mm. um, and the look at memory yeah. as like 
a democratic thing and like the idea of holding multiple truths i just like i like the meta layer to it yeah yeah and the way you know that memories are co-produced and Mm, and how that interacts with power like especially when you're talking about childhood memories like who is it that gets to decide how things are remembered from yeah. someone who is like a juvenile like I, I thought that was really interesting yeah definitely and that the kind of trade-off which I found one of the most interesting themes of the book was like people um kind of wanting the the mother to be uh, treated well in her old age and the the resentment that the main mm. character harbors about that because because they don't have that tethered emotional connection that she had and the the bad things that she experienced growing up with her mother like mm. they they can kind of just leave with that because it doesn't affect them but you know i suppose how our how our paths are always reinterpreted in the present to shape our present day relationships and, yeah and how we like plow forward yeah. especially when you're talking about mortality and like end of life it's kind of like the payoff you get for being a good parent is that you will be looked after so if you weren't performing that role to the sense that your child approved of or thought was right yeah then do you deserve like that sort of i don't know like that, that weird co- co-creation of the future i don't know yeah it's a really excellent book if you guys haven't read it um i can't wait to see what doji does next my only gripe is i wanted more from the cult but that's obviously because of we knew the connection with wild wild, wild, wild country if you guys haven't watched wild wild country the documentary series so insane we watched it like on a flight didn't we back to back like when we went to yeah. south korea on holiday oh, yeah, we like um we're obsessed with it and um Avina Doshi's aunties were in the cult, cult, religious, what's it called? Commune? It's cult. It is a cult, <laughs> but what's the word? Ashram. Ashram, ashram. Um, and they have a, they, like, it's the same one that's in the documentary because they talk about the white that they wear and, like, the hypnotic dancing that they do. So, yeah, if you haven't seen that, yeah, it's really interesting. Weird, kind of orgiastic. Yeah, but like, I really hope yeah. her next book like I would love more centered around that like it's so interesting the ashram culture especially from like a colonial point of view like the white women that came to join it and like I don't know I just well, think yeah it's... I found it funny obviously like because we went to Rajasthan when they talk about uh, like Pushkar yeah and, yeah like, all of the like white like dreaded hippies yeah that, that were like every, in every like, cafe <laughs> we ever went to <laughs> no yeah I did like that connection as well but yeah we recommend burnt sugar Big fans, big fans. Looking forward to Doshi's next book. So yeah, your reading's off to a good year. Yeah. A good start. Bunny for me. <laughs> Lads, I need to round off this vlog because I need to upload it, but I haven't finished Detransition Baby. And I know that past me would probably be like, oh my goodness, you need to power read that book today. But you know what? I just haven't been in the mood to read it. I've been in a non-fiction mood. I've put it down. I've read the other things you saw in this vlog and I will finish it and I am having a good time and you will see it in a wrap up. You'll see it in a review, but I'm trying to let go of perfectionism in 2021. So I'm not going to wait for this vlog. Like I'm not going to finish the book just so I can finish this vlog. Cause I'm sure lots of you would like to watch this vlog up until now. And I've mentioned like 10 other books in here. So yeah, I'm just saying, you know, I didn't DNF. I just haven't finished it yet and you will see it in a different video. There is a beautiful blue sky this morning that's bringing me a small bit of joy, so I thought I would share it with you guys. Hi guys, I'm just popping on the end of this to sort of wrap up the video. Uh, it would be amiss of me to post this um, without mentioning what's gone on in America this week. We saw an absolutely abhorrent and violent act of white supremacy with group of far-right anti-semitic horrendous white supremacist domestic terrorists whatever phrase you would like to use to describe the people that stormed the white house um following instructions from donald trump i'm sure as many of you sitting in other parts of the world are equally appalled but um of course continue to 
read the anti-racist books that I promote on this channel but as well as that donate to mutual aid funds I will link down below some mutual aid funds that I have been sent by subscribers or that I have seen on Instagram for um people of colour that need support in Washington and across the states following the actions of those domestic terrorists last week um I'm lost for words as I'm sure a lot of people are I would just remind you that if you are sitting from the UK and thinking wow that doesn't happen here then it was only a few years ago that we lost Joe Cox to um a violent white supremacy attack and we have seen countless attacks on um, Muslims and other people of faith in our country so we certainly aren't able to sit back and say that we don't have those issues here um sorry to bring the tone down or you know make this a serious video but I just um as someone that has people watching them on the internet I feel like it's really important to say those things and especially as a white person so yeah, um, if anyone, any of my lovely watchers from America or any people of colour have anything they want to comment down below, any funds that they're aware of or any donation pages, then please do so. I would love that greatly. And um, yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your week and I will see you again for another reading vlog soon. Bye.